Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. We're going to be reading from John chapter 1. If you'd like to read from your Bible, I'll give you time to turn to that passage and um, reminds me of a friend of mine I went to hear preach. He, he, uh, he said, today we're going to be uh, studying from Hosea chapter 1 and he went blank. His custom was uh, to say, you know, Hosea is found right after so and so in the Bible and just before whatever book followed it. And he looked at his notes and saw Hosea and couldn't remember which came before it, which came after it. He said, we're going to be in Hosea chapter 1. It's right before Hosea chapter 2 in your Bible. So John chapter 1 is right before John chapter 2 in your Bibles. Um, Father, we need your help. We need the anointing of the Holy Spirit so much. Without you, we can do nothing. And Lord, if we're not careful, we'll get used to doing things. We'll get used to leading worship or preaching or teaching or whatever we do. And not even meaning to, we'll rely on our own strength or our own abilities. So we're asking you to help us always be mindful. Oh Lord, there's a dozen ways you can show us. But help us to remember how mindful we need to be of our need for the anointing. And we just want to pause right now to say, come Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, manifest yourself in this service. Touch those that don't know Jesus. And as the scripture says, convince them of the truth about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would touch the life of every child of God and bring hope and encouragement. Let faith arise in our hearts and let the need of our lives be met. And we thank you for the privilege of gathering in the sweet name of Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We've been talking about the 12 and we're on number four today. We said a few weeks ago that the disciples are basically divided into three groups of four. And uh, with the exception of Judas, who's mentioned in the last group, as we work through the circles, there's less mentioned about them but each of them carries very valuable lessons. We're, we've talked about Peter and James and John. The lesson we learned from Peter is that there is no way to overestimate, no way to, to adequately give uh, attention to the idea of the Spirit-filled life. We talked about the difference that the infilling of the Holy Spirit made in Peter's life. When we talked about James, we said that heaven's estimation is what matters. It's not what man thinks. It's not um, that we live our lives to the praise of ourselves or strategic planning, but we, um, we realize that that which is great in the sight of men might be little in the sight of God. And we learned that heaven's an upside down kingdom where the first shall be last, the last shall be first, or, or we should put it this way, the first may be last and the last may be first. We, in other words, the lesson of that is we can't look at a man or woman's life and make an honest um, or, or an accurate, we can make an honest, but we can't make an accurate evaluation of their life because there's so much that heaven has planned and that heaven works that we don't understand until we get to the other side. That's what we learned from James. As we talked about John last week, we emphasize the infilling uh, of the Holy Spirit, not only for power as we did with, with uh, Peter, but we talked about the ongoing sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit where we're transformed um, from what we were to what we ought to be. Now there's a sense in which we, when we're saved, we're transformed immediately. We're born again immediately. That's in our spirit. But in the soulish part of us, the personality part of us, the part of us called the mind, the will, and the emotions, we are being transformed. 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we talked about how John, who was called the son of thunder, was like this. But by the time we get to his life, and remember, John's the only apostle that we get to see for an extended period of time. And by the time we come to the end of his life, he's known as the apostle of love. He's not known as a son of thunder anymore. He's not wanting to call down fire from heaven anymore, unless it's Holy Ghost fire. He's not wanting to judge people that didn't measure up to his criterion anymore. He's a disciple of love. Now today with Andrew, this is the central lesson of his life. <clears throat> the purpose of life <clears throat> excuse me, is not to climb the ladder of success, but to bloom where God plants you. Now, Matthew 4, I put in there, that's been in every lesson, I think, so far. Uh, um, so we don't need to read it again, except to point out in verse 18 that Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee and he saw two brothers, Simon and his brother Andrew. And that's the Andrew we're talking about today. But John chapter 1 gives us a little bit more of the story. That's the chapter that comes just before John chapter 2. And he said, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. There's a sense in which Andrew was the very first disciple, although he was a part of a group of four friends, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, that basically met Jesus at about the same time, within a, a few weeks of each other. Now, um, <clears throat> you say, what do you mean, Pastor, bloom where God plants you? That, doesn't that kind of sound like a kind of a new age, kind of a everybody should be happy and everybody has a place to, to, you know, to fit in? I don't mean it to sound like that. I mean, when we look at the life of Andrew, and I, I've got to tell you this, every sermon I have ever heard on Andrew focuses on Andrew the soul winner. And it talks about what a great soul winner Andrew was. And he was, that was, that was one of his real attributes. Just about every time we see him, he's leading somebody to Jesus or pointing them to Jesus. But I don't think that is the greatest lesson in, in my opinion, or maybe it's just in regard to our church at this time. I think one of the things that is, is so often overlooked is the idea that for every man, woman, boy, and girl, God has a plan. And we need to find out what that plan is, get in place, and then bloom where you are planted. I'm, I'm so thankful that God is changing things. God's changing things in the church. When I was going through ministerial training back uh, right after the Civil War, if you were... If you were called to preach, the only reason you became a music leader or the only reason you became a children's pastor, the only reason you became a youth pastor was as a stepping stone to become senior pastor. It, it was just, it was just, that's the logical progression. You don't want to be this when you can be this. And now God is doing a work so that, look at our children's pastor. He's as old as dirt. Pastor Frank, you say, Pastor, you're not so young yourself. Pastor Frank is much, much, much older than I am. <laughs> much older than I am. Um, five months maybe older than I am. You say, well, that's not long. You try going without breath for five months. It's a long time. No, seriously, there was a generation ago, you wouldn't have thought of a man be, being a children's pastor into his 60s. But what the church is beginning to teach and what men and women of God and the church in general is beginning to learn is we don't climb a quote ladder of success. We find where God wants us and then we are content to be there in the will of God until he directs us into other paths. It's sort of like a lesson I learned um, at, the, uh, at a landscaper, at a plant and garden shop. I went in and told him what I was looking for <clears throat> and, and 
please don't drive by my house looking for evidence that I visited a landscaper because there's none there. But uh, he took me from plant to plant. He said, this is what you need. Uh, and he said, now the thing about this light is that it needs, a, I mean, this plant is that it needs a lot of light. It needs a lot of attention. This is a high maintenance plant. He says, now this one over here, this is probably what you want. He said, you can't kill this. In fact, if you plant this, it could become a plague on your yard, taking over everything else. You could water this with battery acid and it would live and still look good. And, and he kept telling me that's what I needed. And I wondered if he had driven by or something. I didn't know what was going on. But you know what? That's the way a lot of Christians are. I, I don't mean that critically. Part of it's our personality. Part of it's just the way we're made. Part of it's the baggage that we carry. But some of us are high maintenance. And some of the most gifted people I know, there's a high price to their giftedness because they're very high maintenance. But at the same time, there are people that can live in the shadow. They can live in poor soil. They can live in extreme heat. They can survive extreme cold. And it's not that these plants, one is better than the other, but there's a value. There's a value. Now, if God made you to be high maintenance, that's fine. If God made you to, to thrive in the spotlight, that's okay. But Thank God for those Christians that learn it's not about being in the spotlight. It's not about getting high or requiring high maintenance and getting it. It's about thriving where God plants you. Now let's look at Andrew, this brave man. You say, why don't you call him a brave man? Well, that's what his name means. Andrew basically means manly. And um, it, it's often used to describe a strong, brave man. Now Andrew and Peter were called into ministry together, but Andrew had already encountered Jesus through the ministry of John the Baptist. You know, I said that there were probably at least four of the 12 that were disciples of John the Baptist before they were disciples of Jesus. And according to John chapter one, Andrew and John were ministering with John the Baptist. Jesus walked by. When you read the account, you find that Jesus, that time he was baptized, it was probably a three day period that he was there with John the Baptist. And Jesus walks by and John and Andrew hear the baptizer point at the Lord and say, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Man, that's who he'd been preaching about. That's who he had been telling his disciples about. And that's why John doesn't get upset when John and Andrew pack up and start following Jesus. That's what they had been trained to do. That's what every true proclaimer of truth says. He says he must increase even if it means I decrease. You can always tell something about the character of a witness, of a disciple, of a pastor or a teacher by if, how much of the glory and attention they're willing to give to Jesus. And John said, he's got to increase. And that means I've got to decrease. And that's fine. And he said, boys, there he is. The Messiah, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And John was probably in tears as they walked away, not out of sorrow of losing those disciples, but out of great joy in knowing that they were following the Christ. Now, John had prepared them for this day, and Andrew went to Peter and told him, Look, we have found the one who is the Messiah. And a few days, probably weeks later, Jesus came to Capernaum and it was then that the brothers were called. That's when he said, follow me and I will make you fishers for men. So that's the background of Andrew's call. <clears throat> he was part of the initial group, but Andrew was usually very much in the background. Uh, and, and that tells me something about the nature of apostolic calling. I think the church is wrong today. We generally identify people with a strong personality and we call that an apostolic personality. And our calling is never based on our personality. Our calling is based on what God says we are. And I think the whole apostolic movement is going to have to take a step back one day and find out that just because you've got a strong personality doesn't mean you're apostolic. 
Because here was a man that never seemed to step out of the shadows. But he was clearly one of the apostles and one of the most effective ones. Um, but you wouldn't know that right away. He was not included in several of the important events, which included Peter and James and John. He's noted as a soul winner and had a gift for seeing opportunity in unlikely places. Now, we talked about this, I think, in the very first lesson with Peter. He was originally from Bethsaida, but relocated with Peter to the village of Capernaum. Uh, he was the son, according to the best history we can muster, he was the son of Jonah and Joanna, okay? And for those of you that may be new Christians, this isn't Jonah that we read about in the Old Testament. This was another Jonah or Jonas. That's why Simon was called Simon Barjona and Andrew would have been Andrew Barjona. Um, I think I mentioned this, but when you see either Bar or Ben, one is Hebrew, one is Aramaic for son of. So Simon bar Jonah meant Simon, the son of Jonah. Uh, my son Jeremy would be Jeremy bar Stephen, you know, if, if, uh, if we still went by those designations. A law, uh, aside from the lists of the apostles, <coughs> Andrew is mentioned about 10 times. And usually it's only in passing. <coughs> I'm so sorry, excuse me. If I'd done better with landscaping, I wouldn't be like this from working in the yard yesterday. So you can take a, you can write that down as another life lesson. <laughs> he always lived in the shadow of Peter, but it apparently didn't cause any kind of resentment or jealousy for Andrew. He, he had an amazing ability to bloom in the shadows. You know, sometimes the younger child, especially the baby of the family, and we don't know that Andrew was the baby, but we know that he was the younger brother. Babies kind of grow up with a complex. Um, uh, the older siblings always say, it wasn't that way when I was uh, your age. You know, there may only be 18 months different, but when I was your age, it wasn't like that. Well, I know what it was like growing up with my brothers. I got the greatest brothers in the world. But, you know, my, my oldest brother was a Marine and was the, was the hero of my life. And I just, I thought I'll never measure up to what my brother has accomplished. Uh, my other brother, um, we, we, were, we were more alike in personality and disposition, and um, I was never the athlete that he was. Every, every sport I played in school, I was compared to my older brother. We, 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 could, uh, we could both dress up. I could wear an $800 suit. He could wear a $200 suit and still look better than me. He's a better speaker than me. He's got a more outgoing personality than me. And I love him with all my heart, but I always felt like I'll never be quite like my brothers. And, you know, there's good natured ribbing about that. Um, my brothers are 15 and 12 years older than me. So I was always referred to as an accident. And uh, it was good natured and it was, it was just being funny. But you know what? Um, I mean, even my, my mom said that. She said, you were unexpected. You were an accident. And, uh, but she said it teasingly and good nature. Never bothered me. I joked along with it all my life. But there came a time in my early uh, adulthood, my, it was in my late 20s, when the devil assaulted me with such venom and hatred that I began to, to say, yeah, I am an accident. I, I wasn't intended to be. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just the product of an unguarded night of passion. You know, I'm just an accident. And the devil uses that with a lot of younger siblings and a lot of the younger children. So, you know, I talked with Rebecca and I said, we're going to turn this thing around. Um, um, my brothers jokingly used to say, well, mom and dad were happy with their kids. Each one was wonderful till you came along. You made them stop. So Becca and I, Becca, who's my baby, we turned it around and we said, no, they had children till they got it right. And then they stopped. But I want to tell you, uh, every age, whether you're the older child, middle child, younger child, we all have a unique uh, perspective on life. And if you're not careful, especially if you're overshadowed by a sibling, like I, th I think both of my brothers are, are superior to me in so many ways. And that's not, that's not false humility. And I don't grovel in that anymore. I've, I've found my place. 
and, and, and I'm very happy and very content. But I did go through a very tough spot, not because of them, but because of me trying to figure out what significance did my life have. I had to sit down and have a talk with my mom before she died. And I, I said, I know it's not true, but tell me, tell me what this means. You were an accident. And she was mortified. She said, I, it was a joke. We were te she, and then she told me the circumstances of my birth. And it, and it, it, she had never told me that I was, I was over 30 years old. She had never told me. And there was a great significance that I didn't know about that changed my perspective. But some of you are here and your birth order, you may not be the baby. You may be the oldest. You, you, you may feel like you've, you know, had to lead the herd in all ways. And all of us probably in some way or another have some issues with family and so I think Andrew's a good guy for us to look at because he was overshadowed by a sibling and spent his entire life in the shadows, but God used him in a phenomenal, phenomenal way. Now, let's look at four characteristics of Andrew and then we'll, we'll start wrapping this thing up. Um, number one, this is so important. Andrew was able to love and influence his own family. You say, well, of course, they were his family. Can I tell you that's one of the most difficult things for you to do? It, it really is one of the most difficult things. And some of us here today are probably devastated. We're living with some devastation caused by our spouse, um, caused by a sibling, caused by our children, caused by our parents, because one of the toughest places to be taken seriously, one of the toughest places to, to be recognized for what you are is, is in the family. Now, there are some reasons for that. I think, uh, I think it's almost always unintentional. I think, it's, I think it's almost always unintentional. Um, one of the reasons that we find difficulty in being recognized by our family is, um, is our family sees us, uh, as my pastor used to say, warts and all. Um, when someone has a very public profile, usually they only project um, the, their, their best side. That's why I think, I, I think the best preachers, the best pastors, the best teachers, they, they, if they use themselves as an example, they talk about their weaknesses as well as strengths. And um, uh, not everybody learns that. And sometimes you might not be taken seriously by your family just because they see you warts and all. They don't think you're a hypocrite. They don't think you're not genuine. They just, they just realize that there's an element of reality that you don't always make public. It's like a, a preacher friend of mine, uh, he told this story. I just love it. He was introduced at a, a James Robinson Bible conference. He was introduced as one of the truly great men of God in the country. And he was overwhelmed by the introduction that he got from uh, James Robinson, one of the truly great men, one of the truly great men of God in the country. And he told us next year at the conference, he said, he said, leaving the conference, he said, I was so, he said, I was so overwhelmed by the introduction. He said, my wife and I were driving from Fort Worth uh, back over to Dallas. And I said, I wonder how many truly great men of God that there are. And his, and he just said it innocently and in awe of what of his introduction. And he said, his wife never looked up. She said, probably one less than you're thinking. <laughs> Uh, that didn't mean his wife thought he was a, a, you know, a hypocrite by any means. She just said, I, I see you on the mountaintop and I see you in the valley and you put your pants on, you know, one leg at a time, just like everybody else. We're all vessels of clay. We're all uh, uh, jars of clay. We're, we're what King James calls earthen vessels. Um, that's just the way we are. And our family is the first to see that. But there's another dimension, and it, I don't know what this other dimension is, because Jesus didn't have any warts. But the fact of the matter is, even Jesus' brothers and sisters didn't believe in him until after the resurrection. 
Now you would have thought living in the house with Jesus, you would have, you would have believed he was Messiah before anybody else believed he was Messiah. But you don't see that. In fact, in Matthew 13, do you have that in your notes, Matthew 13? Okay. Um, Jesus was teaching in his, uh, uh, in his home area and the people were furious with him. The people did not accept him. And they said, isn't he the son of the carpenter? Look, they said, here's James, here's Joseph, here's Simon, here's Judas, here's his four brothers, and his sisters are here. We don't know how many sisters he had, but at least two because the word's plural. Six siblings were there. And for whatever reason, we never see them coming to faith in Jesus till afterwards. And this is what Jesus said. Uh, so the people were very unhappy because of what he was doing. But Jesus said, prophets are honored by everyone except the people of their hometown and their own family. Now, why is that? I mentioned it may be the warts and all principle. I don't know, but there's something psychologically about us. We all have this tendency, almost without exception. Now, there are exceptions and, and it can go bad the other way. But we don't seem to appreciate what's around us because we're so close to it. We're so close to it. Um, it's sort of like walking in the Rocky Mountains and you say, boy, that's a steep cliff and boy, that's beautiful trees and boy, look at that buffalo. But when you get away from it a little bit, when you get away from it a little bit, you see the majesty of that 14,000 foot cliff. You know, it's like uh, you have your child and you, you see your child every day, so you don't realize how much they've grown until you mark them on the door every year on their birthday. But Aunt Susie that hasn't seen your child in nine months can't get over how much he's grown. There's just something, and I think it's connected to the idea of familiarity. It's not necessarily bad. It's just a brokenness in us that it's hard for us, the closer we are to something significant, the more difficulty we seem to have in seeing it. But with all of that being said, Andrew had the kind of life and he had the kind of relationship. He had the confidence that he was who he was, born when he was, son of whom he was, in the providence and plan of God. So he overcame natural resistance and we see him leading his family to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amazing thing. Number two, letter B on your outline, I think. He was able to play second fiddle with grace and excellence. Now, Charles Spurgeon said, it takes more grace than I can tell to play the second fiddle well. And I know what Spurgeon was saying was back in that day, I assume it's the same today, I don't know. But the leading uh, musician with whatever instrument was first chair. And, and in Spurgeon's day, it would be first fiddle or first chair of, of, the, uh, of the violin. And the backup or the second position was, is a, became a common phrase, was second fiddle. It meant to not be the one recognized as the best, to not be the one put forth in the spotlight. Now, I want to say this. this I, I'm, I'm trying not to get bogged down here. But a lot of times, we, when I say we need to be content with where God places us, we use that as an excuse for a lack of motivation. We use that as an excuse for passivity. And I'm not saying that you should not strive for excellence or you should not have a holy ambition. <laughs> a lot of people just use this that I'm saying as an idea, as a reason to just be lazy, as a reason to just not work. But there's a difference between caving into passivity <coughs> and realizing that your assignment is second fiddle. We, see, we don't even like to say that. We, we tell people, see, we need to tell our children to be the best that you can be, not to be the best. And we need to tell them <coughs> to bloom where God has planted, even if it is in a shadowy place, because the shadow needs vegetation as well as the light. Philip, or excuse me, Andrew, is a New Testament version of Benaiah in, in the Old Testament. 
Benaiah is one of my favorite um, uh, of the characters in the Old Testament. He was part of uh, David's mighty men. He's the one, Mark Batterson wrote a book, uh, In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day. Uh, one of the most underrated men in the Old Testament. There, there's a lot said about his life, but it's just in passing. Oh yeah, this, you know, you know Benaiah, he's the one that was in a pit and there was a lion. It was a snowy day. It was hard for him to get his footing. It was hard for him to feel the sword, but he still killed the lion. You know, just casual stuff like that. Uh, and this, the scripture says of Benaiah, um, he was renowned among the 30. See, David had his 600, then he had his 300, then he had his 30, then he had his three. He was renowned among the 30, but he did not attain to the three. And David set him over his bodyguard. You find Benaiah playing key pivotal roles all through David's life. But if there were to be paintings of that event, at best, Benaiah would be a man standing over in the shadows. Though David would not have been a success without Benaiah. Let me tell you this third thing about Andrew. He saw the value of insignificant things. Boy, what an amazing gift to have. He saw the value of insignificant people like a little boy in the crowd. If we had all those thousands of people to feed, you know what we would have done? We'd have said, find a businessman and let's get a corporate sponsor. Let's send him down to Chick-fil-A and bring back a biscuit and, and fries for everybody. We, what we need is a corporate sponsor. Tell him that Jesus will wear his name on his robe. If we can get a corporate sponsor. And, 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 and Andrew is the kind of fella that looks around to a little boy huddled over to the side. Some scholars just say this was his lunch. If so, he had an appetite like my grandson and you couldn't fill him up. But probability was with that many pieces of bread, loaves of bread and, and the fish. Probably he was a vendor that was selling fish to those who could afford it. And he was almost out. They call him over and he sees an insignificant person and makes him into a hero. He also saw the value of insignificant gifts like five loaves and two fish. Um, it, it's sort of like Jesus. Oh, guys, I'm trying to move on. You, you with me here? We're doing all right. He's, it's sort of like the woman in the temple that gave her two pennies. And Jesus said she has given more than anyone else, even though their gifts were far greater. It's the principle of 1 Corinthians 1, where Paul said, consider your calling, as he wrote to the Corinthian church. Not many of you are mighty. Not many of you are noble. Not many of you are wealthy or well esteemed in the eyes of men. But God has chosen the weak and foolish things of the world, the powerless people of the world. God has chosen because they know how to let him show his power through them. Now that doesn't mean if you're mighty. It doesn't mean if you're wealthy. It doesn't mean if you're intellectually head and shoulders above everybody. It doesn't mean God can't use you. It just means he has to work harder to use you. Nobody gets my jokes. Let's go on. We'll see how it goes over in second service. <laughs> Here's the fourth thing before we go to our life lessons. He was a rare breed, and it seems he always speaks with wisdom. And, and Andrew, remarkably, we never see Jesus needing to correct him. Boy, James put it this way. He says, the tongue can't be mastered by the flesh. It, James makes it clear, if we can control our speech all the time, it is because it's a work of the Holy Spirit. I think that's one of the reasons that tongues is such a valued experience in the life of the believer. I think it's also the reason it's often neglected in the lives of believers. I think it's the reason it's rejected by a large part of Christianity is anything connected with the tongue must be subjected fully to the Holy Spirit because we can't master it. We can't master it. It can't be done by the flesh. It's, a, it's a, a work of the Spirit. And James says, if you ever find somebody who really has their tongue under control, are you ready for this? He says, that is a believer of excellence. And boy, Andrew, Andrew, now that doesn't mean he doesn't have bad days. He was one of the disciples that fled as well 
when Jesus was arrested. He wasn't perfect, but there's nothing, if there was ever correction he received as an individual, now he received correction as, as Jesus corrected the group, but it was so insignificant that it never made it into the gospel accounts. And, and in fact, he, he's just magnificent. Each time we see him um, uh, in the gospels, um, when, when usually he's just mentioned in passing, but when we do hear him or see him as part of a story, he's either introducing someone to Jesus or he's correctly assessing a situation and offering a wise and steady response. He was steady. He was loyal. And guys, let me just tell you this as somebody that's worked with leaders and church leaders for 40 years, I have found that a person like Andrew is an indispensable gift. I have found that it's not always the people with the greatest gifts that you want in leadership. It's not always people with the greatest mind you want in leadership. It's not always people with the greatest abilities that you want in leadership because a lot of times you don't know who's gonna show up at those meetings. You don't know which side of them is going to show up at that meeting. Is it going to be the, the, the side where you say, blessed are you, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but Father in heaven? Or is it going to be the one where you have to say, get behind me, Satan? But Andrew was that steady, loyal person. Now let's, let's wrap this up and leave this first circle of disciples by looking at four lessons quickly from the life of Andrew I've, I've touched on almost all of them uh, already, but let me develop them just a little bit further. Here's number one, letter A on your outline. I think Andrew is perhaps the greatest role model for most of us for this reason, because he labored in obscurity. Not all of us have the natural leadership, uh, leadership skills of Simon Peter or of James. Not all of us have the passion and, and the intimacy with Jesus like a John, but all of us have the opportunity to serve the Lord in the shadows if that's what he desires. Not all of us are called into the light. Um, you know, I've noticed this about landscaping. A lot of times when you have a real sunny area, people put cactus there. And cactus are beautiful, but they're also very prickly. So Andrew is a beautiful example of one who labors for Jesus in, in immensely successful, but he labored in obscurity. I want to tell you that I believe some of the great, now, now please, those of you that have a big personality, please don't be offended by that. There's a place for things to be done that can only be done by big personalities. I, I know that. There, there, are, there are ministries that if you don't have a big personality, you'll just get steamrolled and you'll never be able to fulfill what God wants you to do. I know that. But today's not the day we're honoring big personalities. The day is the day we're honoring people that have significant giftings but are willing to work in, uh, in obscurity. I, I'm coming to believe that that day that we call the judgment seat of Christ is going to be so amazing for so many reasons. I think it's going to be amazing because our love for Jesus, the sacrifice that we live for Jesus will be made public. The secret things that we did just for him, nobody knows about, will be made public and we will be honored for those things. I think it will be amazing to see how God gifted everybody in the body individually and rewards them individually. But I think that day is going to also be significant because we will at least least in some cases, be surprised at who heaven puts at the top and who we put at the top that heaven may have a little further down the list. It's interesting that Andrew is not mentioned in the book of Acts after chapter one. Um, he preached, we know this from history, he preached throughout Asia Minor into Eastern Europe as far as Russia. And this guy, this guy is patron saint of Scotland, <coughs> Russia, Romania, the Ukraine, and a handful of other nations. I mean, he, with the exception of Thomas, <coughs> he may have gone further from uh, Jerusalem than any other disciple. Now, 
according to the tradition and story of the church, history of the church, he was crucified near Athens. A lot of his ministry was in Asia Minor. Uh, he was crucified near Athens after leading the wife of a provincial Roman governor to faith in Christ. The governor did not like this, that this man led his uh, wife to another religion. So he said to his wife, you must recant your faith in this Jesus. And she said, I can't. He is my Savior. He's my Lord. And not wanting to kill his wife, he said, well, then I'll kill the messenger. And he took Andrew and crucified him. Uh, and it was what we call the St. Andrew's cross. You see it kind of in the shape of an X. He was painfully tied to the cross, according to tradition, instead of being nailed there. But he was tied in such a way that the, the circulation to his extremities were, were cut off. Um, uh, vital organs wouldn't, um, wouldn't work. And it was a very painful and slow death because of the way he was, he was attached to the cross. It took him two days to die. But as he hung on that cross for two days, the history uh, says that except for occasional lapses into unconsciousness, he would talk to everybody who came by, even those who came by to mock him about the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And he preached the gospel right up to the moment he took his last breath. What a man, what a guy. Now, here's the second thing. Now, number one, he's a role model for us all because not many of us, I mean, and, and yours truly included, not many of us are a star that shines on a big stage. But every one of us can learn from this man. Um, you, your gifts are never wasted, even if the world tells you you ought to be this or you ought to be that. He's a, he's a, a model to us to understand that our, our life is not to be lived according to what others think we ought to be. Not every open door is the will of God. In fact, my pastor used to tell me, he, he, you know, he, I, I was going to a church that was smaller and I thought, you know, is this a smart thing to do? And we talked a little bit and he said, son, remember this, every move in the will of God is a promotion. Every move in the will of God is a promotion. Just ask Elijah, he would say. He said Elijah was moved from this place where he was provided for to this place where he didn't know that he had anything. And he said every move in the will of God is a promotion. Now, um, here's the second thing that I, that I want you to understand. Let her be on your outline. There's a difference between a life of passivity and a life of purpose. I was asked in a class I was teaching a few months ago, what is the one characteristic of great men of God that you have known? What is the characteristic of great men of God that you have known? Uh, and and because I, I had been talking about Jack Hayford and some others, and I kind of turned it around. I said, well, what do you think is the characteristics of great men of God? And they had some pretty good answers. They had some silly answers, but they had some pretty good answers. And um, I said, well, to, to the person that said it's a matter of gifting, um, I said, it might surprise you to know that, uh, I, that uh, there are those among the greatest men of God I've ever known that didn't have any particularly significant, outstanding gifting. They were just good men, good women, faithful to the Lord. So it's not a matter of gifting. And said, in fact, I think uh, if you have an outstanding gifting, that means that you must, must, must spend more time in the presence of God or you'll learn to live on your strength instead of his strength. Um, um, there are, and some people have given an excuse for failing in ministry. Well, if my church was located where your church is, I would be successful. If, if my wife could do what your wife could do, I would be successful. And I hear all of these excuses. Um, and I told them that it's not opportunity. You know, somebody said Tommy Barnett was such a successful pastor in Davenport, Iowa, because he was just in a fertile field. And Tommy Barnett, this is before he went to, to Phoenix, he said, oh yeah, he said, people are lined up on the interstate coming into Davenport saying, how can I be saved? How can I know Jesus? And he, he said, no, he said, in fact, this is one of the toughest places I've ever pastored. 
but God has been faithful. So it's not a matter of being in the right place at the right time. It's not a matter of education. Uh, you know, you, you can have a doctorate, but if you weren't what you need to be before you received a doctorate, that two or three letters on the end of your name is not going to make you into an effective servant of Christ. I tell you the things that I think are the most, uh, that make the greatest difference in people's life. Number one, is this simply the sovereignty of God? God takes servant A and puts that person here and they're in a life of obscurity. He takes person B, puts them here and gives them a national ministry. And it's not because this man loves God more than this man. It's not because this woman's more gifted than this, uh, than this woman. It's simply a matter of God's sovereign purpose and he says, I will use this person this way and I will use this person that way. And there's nothing we can do to shape that. But the second thing that I think is, makes the greatest difference, and I've seen this almost without exception, most men and women who are servants of God either live a life of pursuit or a life of passivity. And it's the same thing in churches. It's not a matter of your gifting. It's not a matter of your connections. It's not a matter of your talent. It's not a matter of your ability. It's not a matter of your income. It's not a matter of how much money you give to the church. All of those things are wonderful. God says, I'll give to the church the gift, those with the gift of giving. I'll give to the church those with the gift of preaching and those with the gift of prophesying and those with gifts of healing. But he said, he said I'm the one that will do that. But it's not a matter of your gifts. It's a matter of your pursuit of God. It's a matter of your pursuit of God. And I will tell you this, God will set a person with gifts on the side and use a person with no gifts if this person is pursuing God and this person isn't. I, I've, I've seen this over and over again. Pastors that may be, I've known pastors that pastored far beyond their natural ability, but they were always pursuing I've known pastors that didn't live up to their potential. And when you look at their life, their life is marked by passivity. They're good men. They're moral men. They're ethical men. They may be excellent speakers, but they just want to be a chaplain. Well, I don't know you act like you're acting like you're a group of pastors. <laughs> Here's number three. We must understand that I will not be judged in regard to anyone else. My goal is to please the master. See, this is the good thing. Nobody has the right to compare you to anyone else. God will not judge you being compared to anyone else. When we get to the judgment seat of Christ, it will not be a matter of, well, Justin, why didn't you do as much as Joe? Or, or Celia, why didn't you do as, 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 as much as Marie? That no, what my judgment will depend upon has nothing to do with you or any other past or any other life. What matters is, did I please the master? And guys, I, I want to just, I want to tell you how personal this is. I'm, I'm not whining. I, I just want you to know I've, I've hammered through this thing in my life. I've, I've hammered through, I, I, all my life I've struggled with self-esteem. All my life, I'm, I, am, I am exponentially better than I was years ago. But it's always been a struggle for me. It always, the, the approval, not the approval of man, that, that'll kill you. But the approval of those I love has always been so vitally important to me. That's why peer pressure was not a problem for me in school. It just generally wasn't a problem. Not because I was so holy, but because nothing mattered to me more than the approval of those I loved. And the approval of my parents meant far more to me. The approval of my brothers meant far more to me than the approval of the crowd at school. So sometimes it can work to your advantage. But I tell you what that did for me. Um, it, 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 put, it put me in a situation where I, I just got hammered the first few years of ministry. I, did, I, I wanted to leave so desperately because I thought every pastor was treated like you treat me. I thought every pastor was treated like my pastor was treated. He was a father to the older ones and to the younger ones like me. He was a grandfather. He was the only grandfather in effect I had in my life. 
He, he was just, and, and we honored him. We loved him. And I thought everybody would treat their pastor that way. Now you do, but I want to tell you, not everybody I pastored, you know, they told us on day of graduation, they said, the world is waiting for you. And I believed it. And it didn't take me long to find out they are waiting, but it's with sticks, swords, rocks. So I want to tell you what I've had to fight because of this character flaw in me. All my life, I have been hammered by people that say things like this. A good pastor ought to do this. A good pastor would have been at this meeting. A good pastor would have, and, and I, I cannot possibly measure up to those things. Now, please understand, I, I wouldn't tell this to you unless I felt like I had victory. And I wouldn't tell this to you if you were doing it. You, you're not doing it. But all through my ministry, there have been some that just, I, you can't please them. And I used to lay it awake at night, you know, how I've got to do this, I've got to do that. But years ago, the Lord helped me understand, I can't meet everybody's expectations. It's just not possible. And he was so gracious in giving me a church that loves me the way you love me. So it, it's not an issue here. Please understand, I'm not fussing at the church. But I do want you to understand that sometimes we love people so much. And, and I, I, I don't know of anything I want more other than my family feeling that way. I don't know of anything I want more than the church to say, Pastor, we love you. We're proud of you. You meet our needs but can I tell you that I had to get to the point and God let me have people that didn't feel that way until I got to the point where I said, I don't need the approval of man. I need the approval of the master and loved ones. Listen, I'm not saying this for, for me. I'm saying it for you. You've got to stop trying to meet everybody's expectations you can't do anything, everything the way others think you ought to be doing. Now, I don't mean you disregard well-intending people. You don't throw your family out of your life. Your family has legitimate needs, and you need to meet some of those expectations. But I'm saying that Andrew did a marvelous job. He is running in the upper tier of disciples, and, and the Pentecostal evangel probably wrote an article talking about Andrew, the great underachiever. Andrew ought to be doing this. Andrew should have been on the Mount of Transfiguration. Andrew should have been in the raising of Jairus' daughter. And then the editorial would have said, and you know what? If he really loved Jesus like he said, he probably would have been there. Can I tell you that one of the greatest gifts you can develop in your life is the ability to say no when everybody says you ought to say yes. It's the ability to put first things first, even if it means you live in the shadows. Let me go to the last thing. Remember, the day of reward will dignify all mistreatment and will set right all misunderstanding. I, I just want to say this in, in conclusion. Hebrews 6.10, for God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you've shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. <coughs> Loved ones, Andrew teaches me this. There's one thing I want to hear more than anything else. Oh, I'm looking forward to going to heaven. I don't want to go right now. I, I'm, 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 not, I'm, I'm not like Paul. I'm not torn between staying and going. I want to stay. But I will tell you this, the older I get, the more loved ones I have on the other side, the more treasure I have on the other side, the more I realize that that's going to be a place where I'll see loved ones I've never seen and, and, and a place where we'll all be secure in the presence of the Lord. But as much as all the wonders of heaven are, I can tell you this to the best of my ability, I've cleared my heart so that I can say this with all integrity, more than anything else in life, I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't need him to say, hey, here's old Chitty. He had the biggest church in South Carolina. Here, here's, here's Stephen's home. What a guy. No, I mean, those things are wonderful if that happens. 
But I can honestly say the driving force of my life is him saying, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, it, I, I, I would suspect something if, if my wife said, you know, you're the most handsome person on planet Earth. Because I know that's not true. I mean, I'm in the top three or four, but... <laughs> I mean, as long as there's Roy and others in competition, I mean, I'm not going to make it to the top, you see. I, 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 I don't expect my children to say, Daddy, you're the, you're the most perfect daddy that's ever been. You've never made any mistakes. Because I know it's not true. But nothing warms me on this side more than my family to say, we believe in you. We love you. I was talking about in a funeral the other day, and I'm not planning it out, but on my headstone, if my family believes it, and it's only if my family believes it, I hope on my gravestone it'll say, Jackie Stephen Chitty, you know, born 1955, died 2055, you know. But here's what I want. He was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. That's the highest accolade on this side of heaven. A good man, a good woman, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. A good man, full of the Spirit, full of faith. And when we get to the other side, well done. Good and faithful servant good and faithful servant. Would you stand with me, please? Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the example of Andrew. And I pray you'd move by the power of the Holy Spirit right now in Jesus' name. Loved ones, would you look this way? It's, it's time for us to go. I know that. And, and, um, and, and we're going to let you go in just a moment. But I want to do a couple of things in the altar today. As always, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, when we dismiss you in just a couple of minutes, please, instead of going out the back doors, would you come and find an altar ministry team? And ministry teams, if you'd move into position now, I would appreciate that. Come to one of these uh, sets of ministry teams that are here at the front and just say, I want Jesus in my heart. And that would mean so much to them to be able to talk to you about serving Jesus and following him. Number two, if you're here and you have a special need, maybe you're sick, maybe uh, a loved one is sick. And, and guys, so much is happening, some of it in service, some of it outside of service. But God is doing some miraculous healings in our midst. God is touching some people in a phenomenal way. And we praise God for that. But here's the third thing. And I know this, is, this could be very difficult, very critical, very tender. But I have felt as I prayed that there were some here that you are just discouraged. You're discouraged. Some of you just discouraged because it seems your whole life you've been in the shadow. It, it seems in your whole life you may have even had abilities that haven't been recognized or Maybe you feel like I haven't even stepped into what I'm capable of doing because it seems that God just has you in the shadows. And, and can I say this? Some are here, you even have felt betrayed and hurt by the church. Maybe this church, maybe a past church, but you felt betrayed and hurt because you feel like you've got so much to offer. You're so willing to work, but you just don't seem to be able to break through the way you want to break through. And you're carrying an offense. You're carrying disillusionment. You're carrying a sense of I, I, life is not fair to me. Uh, loved ones, I, I, don't know, I don't know what issue you may be struggling with. It may be legitimate. You may have been done wrong. It may be just a result of baggage that you carry. I know that a lot of my battles have, have had to do with like I said, struggles for self-esteem and things like that. In other words, the offense wasn't even real. 
some of the time. Other times it was very real, very real. But I do know this, whatever you're facing, I believe with all of my heart, there's healing power in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is able to take that hurt and heal it. He's able to take the hurt and heal it. Somebody said one time, what's the difference between a, a tattoo and a scar? And um, somebody said, scars are generally uh, tattoos with stories. And, and uh, you know, tattoos may be there for a lot of reasons, but scars are tattoos with stories. And God is able to turn your scar into a badge of victory. He's able to take that sense of rejection and turn it. God's not given you that spirit. God's not a God of rejection. He's not a God of pride or arrogance, but he's not a God of rejection. And I want to encourage you to come while this beautiful ministry team just leads us into the presence of the Lord. I want you to just come find a place to just worship the Lord. You can talk to a team or you don't have to. But I believe this is a day for healing. God wants to set this thing free in your life. Now to those who have to go, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Lord, we thank you in advance for the eight people that are going to be baptized at the beginning of the next service. Thank you for souls that are being saved and lives that are being changed. But Father, some of your choice servants today are struggling. They, they've, they, they don't even know it maybe until today, but they have the anointing and the calling of an Andrew. They, they, they don't have to be corrected. They don't have to be rebuked by the Lord because they're steady and they're faithful. They're wise. They're measured in their, in their walk. But Lord, they don't see the light of the spotlight very often. And it's easy for them to feel unappreciated. Father, would you draw them in close and just, just whisper in their ear what they're going to hear on that day. Well done. Well done, good and faithful servant.